our scriptures today are from Micah chapter 6, verse 8, the New Living Translation, and from Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39, from Micah. A little background. The in Israelites asked Micah how they should respond to God, his blessings, his saving acts on their behalf. Should they burn offerings, bring him rivers of oil, give him their firstborn for their sins? Here is Micah's answer. No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 39, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, you are in everything we see, feel, and do. You call us to humble giving and joyous living. We hear your call and seek a vision for servitude. Amen. I was happy to read in response the UMW magazine that this summer UMW will begin a two-year mission study on poverty. As the editor, editor stated in her article, nobody but nobody works harder than poor folk. Poor people work on and off the books for long hours often in multiple low-wage jobs without health insurance or even sick days off, harvesting crops, cleaning bedpans, caring for children, the ill, the elderly, building, moving, and tearing down things. They work very hard at jobs critical to any society and get the least to show for it, including respect. Is there any wonder the biblical prophets single out the poor along with widows, orphans, and immigrants but for special divine care? As Lynette read in Micah, it is important for us to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I began with an Old Testament scripture because I want to share with you what I learned from a Jewish professor that was in the social work department at the University of Georgia. Dr. Levine had an office on the campus where I worked. My employment required I find volunteer positions for students in the community agencies, organize crisis line training, and run a food program, nothing a young adult could not manage with 15-hour days. Dr. Levine imparted insight that changed the way I have seen charity throughout my lifetime. The Jewish community has eight levels of charity, and I will share a few of those. At the very lowest level, a person gives unwillingly to someone who has to ask for help. As we proceed up the levels, level seven, you give inadequately, but with a smile. Level six, give only after being asked. And at level four, give without being asked, but the person receiving the gift knows the giver. At the lower levels, you can see the person receiving help is embarrassed and the giver is rewarded with a feeling of superiority or with the gratitude of the person in poverty. And so much charity is operated at this level. At level three, the poor do not know who gave them the gift, but we know who we gave to. And so we still have that sense of superiority over our neighbor. Now level two is my very favorite level. It's to give anonymously. So we give anonymously and the receiver does not know who gave the gift. This is how I see apportionments in the Methodist Church. I give to God because I know I have bounty to share and someone in need will receive the gift without a feeling of obligation to me. It is a pure gift and in the Jewish tradition they called it a gift for heaven. Around the time of Jesus, men with wealth would walk through the synagogue. They would tie coins in the hem of their garment, and people who were poor would come up and take coins from the hems, never seeing the face of the giver. And of course, the giver never knew who took the coins. And that was how they accomplished their gift for heaven. 
According to this philosophy, we are to have giving hearts that do not judge the poor and are not dependent on gratitude from the poor to boost our ego, and I really like that. This requires us to do our own heart work as people of God, especially as we process our own neediness and the paybacks from acts of charity. The highest level of charity is to give a person the tools to make a living in financial independence. About 15 years ago, I co-founded a welfare to work program with two of my lady friends, and the program's still up and running today. One man in our program was a third generation welfare head of household. He had a dream to go to trade school 80 miles from this rural community. He could either take the program for three years nights, driving with a beat up old car that might or might not make it, after working all uh, full time all day, and this is what welfare required of him, or he could go for nine months and complete the program uh, without working. Well, he was trying to figure out how to solve the problems and came to us, and his wife worked as a CNA with her salary and with the help, food assistance they got from the local pantry. We could accomplish this goal by simply helping about with about $200 a month for child care. We also repaired the vehicle more than once and gave occasional gas money. The man made straight A's through mechani the mechanical maintenance course. At the end, he was rewarded with a job beginning at $36,000 a year at Fort Riley. The transition in their lives was far less expensive than welfare and their process required three things from him, just as it did from any families who came to the Family Resource Exchange. We expected our families to take responsibility for their own debts. We would help with their debts, but they first had to contribute something to their debts. The second thing we required was responsibility for their own dreams. Whatever education and training they accomplished was uh, simply their reward for their efforts put forward. We might help with the money, but this gentleman had to go and take the classes. And the third thing we expected from our families was they had to give back to the community. I think it's sad when we don't expect the poor to give something back. They have something to give. We expected them to volunteer in their church, in the school that their children attended, or in the community. The long-term benefits emotionally and financially to the children in these families was absolutely priceless. The details of the Welfare to Work program are not the point of this sermon, but the heart work of givers is, how do we rethink charity in our churches? I struggled with my role in this charity because I could not accomplish the gift for heaven by remaining anonymous. I did attempt to give absolute acceptance of the poor and dignity in our contracts and our planning sessions. But I had to recognize that the gifts from individuals and churches were gifts from heaven for other people, and I was simply responsible for handling those gifts. I wrote a poem about my personal struggle as I received so many personal rewards from the families I served, and it's called The Price of Bread. A vehicle chokes on fuel and age, angs expelled in a burned fossil cloud. From window seven to the window's pane, I refocus. Connect the shines of car doors and children, images less smooth than the geometric doodles of my screensaver. My elbows rest on bulging folders of food and utility vouchers. In my overfed self, I perch, wait for her to near, wait to digest her pain. I study her clothes, the sandals sold for a quarter at the church's closet a faded too tight tee and threadbare jeans, not unlike designer jeans intentionally slid at the knees. Her children appear as accessories, part of the ensemble, one on her hip and one held by the hand. I see the dread in her eyes. She must count the details of her poverty, her failure, her children's hunger. I host the coerced confessional, each intimate detail recorded in a folder for an eternity the litany required to feed her children to continue heat and water. Hope has always flown on the wind and in comet tail glow in the certainty that things could change. Civilized, we fly hope on vouchers and statistics and political rhetoric, the shame of poverty. 
the shame of charity. Lynette read from Matthew, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that radical Jesus entered the picture and expected even more from the giver. Self-sacrifice for the greater good. Relieving the poor was no longer just the responsibility of the rich as in the Jewish tradition, but it now became the responsibility of the entire community. Jesus loved people, period. He was willing to wash the, people, the feet of his disciples, proclaim the work of prostitutes, and die on a cross. That is remarkably charitable. How do we mentally, spiritually, or in charity wash the feet of the poor? Galatians 1.10 reads, Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Well, I'm a goal-oriented person, so I have assignments for you. And I want you to pick one of these to do this week. You could remember Galatians 1.10. Remember, you do not need to please people, but serve Christ. When you hear anyone, and I mean anyone, say something unkind about the poor, stop them. I do. The poor are not lazy. Poor parents are shiftless any more than any other population. In fact, one of my challenges in the Welfare to Work program was that poor people were always helping their neighbors. If they had food in their pantry or a few bills in their wallet, they would help their neighbor. My clients were my heroes. I have great respect for what it means to survive even one day in poverty, especially with children. Your second challenge. Look at how your church offers food and financial help. Is there a better use of resources to not only alleviate the crisis with food or money, but with long-term moves towards independence? It takes some organization. And the last challenge, all of you can do this. I want you to give one gift for heaven. Add to a tip amount because you know the waitress has need of dental work. Or send an anonymous, anonymous gift through the mail to someone who could not make their rent. If you are financially challenged, send a note to someone who needs to hear you think they are special. We are all called to give to the poor, and at the same time, remember, we are no better than the impoverished. Humility was Christ's example, and in humility, we must serve. Amen. Please stand and sing our reflection hymn, Refiner's Fire. Ha, 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 ha.